don't throw your old laptop or PC away. Turn it into a top of the range 1995 DOS gaming machine. Let me show you how. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. We all have old computers and laptops lying around, and this is my old EPC from 2009. It's still in great working order, but it's just not powerful enough to be useful using today's software packages. But it's such a nice, neat package that it seems a real waste to just scrap it. Much better to see if we could find a real use for it. So in this video, I'm going to have a go at making a dedicated DOS gaming laptop that will let me play all the great old DOS games such as Doom, Lemmings and so on. So let's see if it works. This EPC is one of the low specification netbooks from around 2009. It's powered by an Intel Celeron M353 processor running at 900MHz with 2GB of RAM and a very slow 16GB SSD hard drive. So whilst these specs seem very poor by today's standards, if we go back to about the year 1995 when DOS really gave way to Windows, we've actually got a top of the range machine. So at that time, a 200MHz Pentium Pro with 500MB of RAM would have been a top gaming PC. So pretty much any laptop or PC that you can find these days will more than cope with this task. Now, one big caveat though is the sound. Uh, sound was usually provided by add-on cards, with the Sound Blaster series being the most popular. Now, these are no longer used in computers, so anything from the past 15 years or so is, is very unlikely to have something compatible inside it. Now, as no one is writing DOS drivers anymore, uh, we're just not going to get any sound with our games using a pure DOS approach. Now, if you are able to retrofit an old Sound Blaster compatible card into your machine, you'll, you'll be fine and you will get sound. Um, otherwise, I'm afraid you're just going to have to make the sound effects by yourself. Uh, and Which for some of the very really old DOS games will actually be an upgrade. So we know that we've got the hardware we need to run the games, but now we need some software. Now the main code we need is DOS itself, uh, and Microsoft DOS came in many versions right up to the MS-DOS versions 7 and 8, which were actually parts of the Windows 95 and 98 releases. Now if you can get hold of the original DOS disk images um, with a license, um, then be, be f feel free to use them. But in this video, uh, I'm going to sidestep that step and um, I'm going to use the totally free and legal um, free DOS. Now this is available for download at freedos.org. Uh, and again, all of these links that I'm using will be in the description um, down below. Now this is an open source implementation of MS-DOS that's completely compatible uh, and will run all the original DOS software. And it also includes a few enhancements to make it run slightly better with more modern hardware. Now the first issue though is, is how to get this onto your machine. And there are three main routes that you can take. So if, if your computer has a CD or a DVD drive, then you can download the live CD image and burn it onto a CD. Then just pop this into your computer and boot from that CD. Uh, and FreeDOS will then let you install it onto your hard drive um, as you would with any normal um, disk installation. The next route is to use the full USB drive install package. So if you download this and burn it onto a USB stick, then and then you need to get your computer to boot from that, and then it should install DOS for you. Now unfortunately for me, I found that this USB method didn't work very well. Uh, my EPC kept attaching the USB stick as hard drive C, and then putting in my SSD drive as hard drive D. Uh, and although the install process recognized all the drives and was happy to install the software onto drive D, uh, once I removed the USB stick, the SSD would then reattach itself as drive C and, and just nothing seemed to work. 
um, I, I couldn't figure out a workaround for this, so I had to resort to the very final option. So DOS used to be supplied on a number of floppy disks, and free DOS can also be used in this way. So each floppy image can be burnt to either a real floppy disk, if you have one on your computer, or to a USB drive. And then you can insert these one by one into your PC to run the installation. So this is the method I ended up having to use. Now to be honest, it's not that bad. So each of the floppy disk images are only 1.4 megabytes, and these pretty much burn instantly onto a USB stick. So on the EPC, when I inserted the USB drive which had got a floppy di disk image on it, um, it was very happy to see that as a floppy drive and then of course mount my SSD drive as the normal drive C. And that made sure then that I was able to complete the installation with no problems. So once the DOS installation is complete, you'll be dropped into the standard DOS prompt. So remove any of your floppy disks or USB sticks and reboot your PC. Now if everything has installed correctly, you should now have a working free DOS computer. Now DOS is one of the old style command line based operating systems. So all you're going to get when you boot up is a flashing cursor asking you what you'd like to do next. So to be able to actually make sense of this, uh, you're going to need to know a very few basic DOS commands. So the first is one that allows you to list the files in your current directory. So just type in dir and then press the return key. If you want to change your current directory, then you use the command cd followed by the directory path. So for example, at the moment, I've got a directory called FreeDOS, so I could change into that directory by typing in CD FreeDOS. If you want to go back up a level, you can CD to dot dot, and that will take you up one level. Um, if you CD to backslash, now remember DOS uses backslashes and not forward slashes, then that will take you to the disk root. Now usually you will have a couple of disk drives attached to your computer, especially when we're going to be loading in some software. So if you want to swap to another disk drive, you simply type the disk letter followed by a colon. Um, for example, if I have something attached as a floppy drive, I can type A colon and that will drop me onto that floppy drive. Now code files in, in DOS come in a number of extensions. Uh, and mostly we'll be running .exe and .bat games for gaming, um, but you'll also come across file names such as .com and so on. So if you can see the file, so when you do dir, if you see the file listed, you can simply run any of these files by just typing in its file name. Um, but of course, making sure you are in the folder where that file is. Uh, if, if you're not actually in that folder, you can specify a path and that will achieve the same effect. Now, getting hold of DOS games is um, something else we do have to look at. So a lot of DOS games were developed by companies that no longer exist or who have basically left their games for dead. And there is something called the DOS abandonware movement, and that has sprung up around this um, in, in, in an attempt to preserve and help people play these old games. Now, a, a good website to have a look at is the abandonwaredos.com website, and, and that will give you lots of information about the project itself and how it works. Now, one, one caveat on all of this, um, as with all software, um, please do assume that it is still under copyright and therefore illegal to download unless you can confirm otherwise. So the Abandonware.com website um, is committed to keeping track of, of all the software status, um, as again, as best as it can. But do keep in mind that their information should be used as a guide and not as permission to actually download and use these files. Now, now, for example, if, if you're on the AbandonwareDOS.com website and you go to the DOS Classic section, um, uh, the first listing you'll find is for a game called Alley Cat. And if you click on that link to get to the game detail page, 
So on the right hand side, you'll see that this particular game is flagged as Abandonware. Now alternatively, if, if you find the listing for the adventure game Secret of Monkey Island, you'll see that this is marked as still under copyright, and again there are no download links for that. So again, use these status signals as a bit of a guide. Um, you will find that some DOS software is actually made freeware now. So one of the big games, Command & Conquer, um, was completely um, released as a freeware title by the manufacturer. So if we now go back to the Alicat page, uh, when we scroll down to the download link section, you'll see that uh, some games will also let you play them online. And this is very handy because you can now browse through and try the games out before downloading them and installing them onto your DOS machine. But for this one, we're, we're gonna download it. So if we click on the download link, that will let us download a zip file with the software. And if we open this, um, you'll see an Alicat folder inside, which is the actual software files. So for this game, there is only a single .exe file, um, but for most games you'll find that there's a whole set of code and data files inside here. So we need to extract all of these software files out of the archive and save them into a folder on um, our main PC. Now I, I put the files for each game into their own folder, just so that I can keep all the games as single units. And we now need to transfer our game files over to our DOS machine. Now FreeDOS does have a network driver, um, but it can be a bit of a pain to get that set up and running. So the easiest way is to use a USB drive. Now if you're lucky, um, an FAT32 formatted USB stick should be seen by DOS, um, though you might have to reboot the machine with it inserted for it to be recognised. Now in, in my setup I was having problems with my USB um, hard drives, um, so it was it, when I put that in it masks off my main hard drive so the EPC wouldn't boot. So to get around this uh, I actually had to use the bootable full USB image from FreeDOS. Uh, I can copy then my game files onto that and then use this boot disk to actually boot the EPC from the USB stick. Now, now this caused my USB drive to become drive C and my hard drive to become drive D um, as I mentioned earlier when I was trying to use this to install the software. But it did, it did mean that I did actually have then two drives that were accessible by DOS at the same time. And this meant that um, I did have everything I need so for you, um, do, do try whatever method you can, whether it's a USB stick or, or putting your games onto a CD or if you've got a floppy drive. But as long as you can see both your game files and the hard drive where you're going to copy them to, then that's everything set up and ready to go. To copy the games, you need to switch drives onto your main hard drive. So that will usually be C colon, or with my mix up on the USB drives for me, that was D colon on my EPC. So this should take you to the root, root folder. You can now make a folder here for your games. Now, now do note that FreeDOS already makes a folder called games uh, with some freeware titles in it. So I'm gonna make a second games folder for my commercial DOS games. So the command for that is mkdir for make directory. I'm going to call mine DOS games. Now note that when you're naming folders and files in DOS, you need to keep to letters and numbers with no spaces. And there also is a, a, an eight character maximum. So DOS file names have an 8.3, so eight characters for the file name and three characters for the extension. Now, now FreeDOS does handle longer file names, but it's, I think it's a good idea to stick to the DOS 8.3 character limit so that you can easily see the file names correctly on screen. And we're now going to copy each um, games folder into this DOS games folder. So switch drive to your games drive and, and find the folder containing your first games. So to check you're in the right place, just run the DIR, DIR command and that should show you the actual folder. So on mine, I've got the Alicat folder in the root of my um, transfer drive. Uh, and we can then copy the whole folder contents across with the following command. So I'm going to use the xcopy command. I'm going to tell it that the files I want to copy are in the Alicat folder. 
And I then want to copy all of those files into the C colon backslash DOS games folder and inside that folder create a folder called Alleycat. So we're going to recreate the Alleycat folder inside the DOS games folder. And then I'm going to specify a backslash E switch at the end of that. And that simply makes sure that any subfolders and their contents as well are copied across. Whenever we copy larger games, you'll find that there'll be subfolders and so on in there. And of course, do make sure that you change the drive letters and paths to match your hard drive. If I now go back to my hard drive, and into the DOS games folder, I should find the Alleycat folder, and then inside that, I should find my Alleycat files. So for me, I need to reboot. Uh, so I've got to take out my USB drive and reboot the computer, and that should bring me back up with my hard drive back as drive C, and I now have access to my games files. So to play the games, you just need to change um, into the drive and directory. Um, where you've actually stored these files. And again, I use the dir command to list the files. Now, again, as I said before, we're looking for a .bat, a .com, or a .exe file. That, that should say something along the lines of the game name, and that should then start it. Now, some games will allow you to install them onto your hard drive. And in that case, you'll be looking for something along the lines of install.bat or, or setup.exe. And, and then that is the file that needs to be run. So if, if in doubt, try to find the manual for the game online. And usually that will give you instructions on how to start the um, code running. So if we look at the files in the Alleycat directory, we'll see there's only one executable, cat. And if we run that, that then starts up the Alleycat game. Alleycat is about as simple a game as it gets, with just the single executable file. But most of the later DOS games used a range of data and code files, usually supplied on multiple floppy disks or a CD. So if you look up the Prince of Persia game on the Abandonware DOS site, you'll see it listed as Abandonware, so we can use the game's files. Now, if you download the game and look inside the zip file, you'll see a whole range of code and data files. And as I say, these would have been supplied on a CD or multiple floppy disks. But the Abandonware site just packages everything up nicely into a single archive file. Transferring a game like this is exactly the same process as with the simple Alleycat game. Just extract the whole game folder onto your PC, and then use whatever method you can to copy that whole folder over to your DOS machine. You then navigate into the prints folder, and if you list the files out with your dir command, you'll find a prints.exe code file. So just type in prints, and the game should start. So really now, it's just a matter of downloading and transferring over any games that you want to have a go with. So we've now got an MS-DOS, or, or at least a free DOS computer, and we're able to play our retro DOS games on it. But you'll notice that we do have this one big missing component, uh, and that is sound. Uh, mouse and keyboard hardware works fine with free DOS, uh, and, and these um, use the standard drivers um, that have been integrated into free DOS, but, but sound is a different matter. So, so modern, and by modern I mean even things like my EPC, so pretty much anything after probably the year 2000, um, they, they use very different sound hardware compared to the original DOS machines. So most of those use Sound Blaster compatible sound cards, and you'll find most games try to use this specification to output sound. So, so pretty much all of the hardware you'll find in later Windows Machine isn't directly compatible, and the effort in writing Sound Blaster compatible drivers for all the different new hardware um, variations is, is just not being worth it for people. So unless you're able to get hold of a real Sound Blaster compatible card and plug that into your PC, um, the chances are we're just simply not going to get any sound working. Um, but this is about the only issue you're going to have. The games will all run perfectly well, so if you're okay with silence, this free DOS route will probably give you the best overall setup for a DOS gaming machine. Now, if sound is a real deal breaker for you, uh, you've really got two choices. 
So if you want to use real hardware, then you're going to have to get hold of a machine that has access to a real Sound Blaster card. Now, if you want to use the machine that you've got in front of you, um, like my EPC here, um, I will be looking at another route where we're going to use emulation under Linux. Um, but again, I'll, I'll cover that in a different video. So, we've managed to turn an old low-spec laptop from junk into a top-end DOS gaming machine. So okay, um, we haven't got any sound, but the games do run well, and we do get to revive this dead machine. For non-sound based tasks, um, even my EPC is a great platform. Coding, office software, and all those other sorts of applications let you sample life in the old 1990s DOS world. So if you do have got if you have got some old files that you can't open with modern applications, uh, now is your chance to get them back and resurrect them. So I hope you find this useful and do have some fun getting a redundant bit of kit back into working order. Don't forget to check out my main Bytes and Bits website for all the links and um, code that we've been using in this uh, tutorial. Please do. Um, like and subscribe to my channel to get access to all my latest videos as soon as I publish them. I hope to see you again very soon in another tutorial, and bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects, and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and visit my website.